I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to Luke 24. To Luke 24. In verse 44 is where we're going to begin. This is Jesus after he's risen from the grave. He's appearing to his disciples. And he tells them this in verse 44. He says, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. That all the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending you forth, or excuse me, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Let's pray that the Lord would give us understanding of the Scriptures as it is His disciples here. Yes, Father, please open our eyes to understand the text that we're going to look at today as we survey the Scriptures and we see what they have to say concerning the Lord Jesus. As He Himself said in verse 44 that the things which were written about Him in the Old Testament testify to His saving work. And so I pray that we would be changed as we behold the glory of Jesus Christ. We praise You. We thank You for Him. In His name we pray. Amen. 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 I will title this, The Suffering Servant. The Suffering Servant. And Luke 24 is actually not what we're going to be going through. I just wanted to read that and open it. To begin our, to kind of open the door, I guess you could say, to what we will be looking at, which is Isaiah 53. And you have certainly heard of Isaiah 53. It is surely the most popular passage in the Old Testament Speaking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. His coming sufferings. In fact, a lot of people have dubbed chapter 53 of Isaiah simply the suffering servant. Because it's really what the whole chapter is about. The Savior is going to come and suffer for the sins of God's people. Oftentimes, we as believers, when we want to look at gospel truth, when we want to look at what does the Bible have to say concerning Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, what we will often do is, where will we flip? Is it the Old Testament or the New? We'll always go to the New Testament. It seems to be our natural reaction. But oftentimes, what we forget is that the whole of Scripture testifies to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, that is the main content of the Bible. The Old Testament pointing to His coming, and the New Testament saying He has come. The Old Testament looking forward, and the New Testament looking backward. All the way back in Genesis 3, we see that God promises the coming seed. Even in Genesis 1, where it says God says, Let us make man in our image. There we already see Christ. And even in verse 1, in the beginning, God, that encompasses the Trinity, encompasses the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And then at the end of the Bible, Revelation 22, it says, And the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. It ends and it begins with Christ. And it continues all throughout the middle. To be Christ. To be about Him. To be about His glory and His grace. And His work. His redeeming work. Now it's very beneficial for Christians to look at the Old Testament record. Concerning Jesus' work. And here's why. Because the Old Testament 
is in foreshadowing. It's, it's, it's foretelling. See, the Old Testament, or the New Testament, is simply a historical account. The Gospels, all four of those are historical accounts of what happened. But the Old Testament, none of the things that they speak about had happened yet. In terms of Christ, talking about how He's the, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the mighty Counselor, etc., etc. The, the, the soul-crushing seed of the woman, spoken of in Genesis 3, all that is pointing forward. It hasn't happened yet. When those things were written, it hadn't happened yet. When those things were given, it hadn't happened yet. That's why in light of the New Testament, the Old Testament has so much new light to it. There's more truth that we can dig into there. There are many passages that I could take you to that we could visit in this sermon that talk about Christ, but I want to make our permanent home for this sermon, Isaiah 53, because it is, as I said, the most jam-packed, full, uh, full, full of gospel truth. In fact, Isaiah 52 talks about Jesus. Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9. They talk about Jesus. They talk about His coming. In fact, Isaiah and many other New Old Testament prophet talks about Jesus. I can take you to uh, 1 Samuel 7, or 2 Samuel 7, excuse me, where it also is talking about Christ. I can take you to Genesis 12, where it talks about Christ. I can take you to Genesis 3, where it talks about Christ. I can take you to a lot of places in the Old Testament. In fact, uh, there's roughly over 400 Old Testament prophecies. Concerning the coming Messiah. Christ fulfills how many of them? Every last one. But surely the mountain peak, the summit of Old Testament texts related to the gospel would be Isaiah 53 on the suffering servant. And just to note, and this is probably the most incredible truth about this passage outside of the passage itself, and that is this was written seven centuries, that is, around 700 years before Jesus is born. So Jesus' grandfathers, 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 grandmothers, grandmothers, they didn't even exist. Generations hadn't even come about yet. Jesus' ancestors weren't even born. And yet, this passage of Scripture so clearly paints the picture of what Jesus came to do. And now the book of Isaiah, just to also note on what is Isaiah's main, main message in his book, a lot of it is about judgment, God's judgment on his people for their rebellion but throughout the book, there are promises of the coming Savior. And here toward the end of the book is this very meaty, very weighty promise. Let's begin in verse 2. It says these words concerning the suffering servant. Verse 2. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot. And like a root out of parched ground. What's he talking about? Why would he use that kind of wording to describe Messiah, the coming Savior? Well, here's why. You don't have to turn there, but in Isaiah 11, verse 1, listen to this. It says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and strength. The Spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide the fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also the righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. Who is he talking about? The coming Messiah. But he begins in verse 1. He is going to be a shoot from the spring. Or excuse me, he will shoot... Uh, he will spring up from the stem of Jesse. In other words, he's going to be a royal descendant. Jesse, again, the father of David. And David was the king of Israel. 
And so David's lineage is a royal lineage. That's like any monarchy. In Britain, they're a monarchy. If you're, if you're a part of a royal family, you are royal. You're part of that lineage. And so Christ comes on the scene as a descendant of David. In fact, uh, we know in the New Testament he is called Son of David. In fact, in Hebrew, if, if people saw Jesus in his day, they would have probably, one of his titles would have been Yeshua ben David. Yeshua ben David. That's Yeshua, that's Joshua. Jesus' is, Hebrew name is Joshua. And then Ben is son of, and David is David. He's saying Yeshua. Uh, son of David. And Yeshua means uh, Yahweh saves. He's the Savior. I would have been one of his names. Also one of his names, just to side note, would have been Yeshua ben Yosef, his father Joseph. Um, but certainly he was known by that messianic title of son of David. So that's what he's referencing in verse 2. That's why he uses that language. He's calling our attention back to chapter 11, where he describes the coming reign of this king. So he, just, he first says in, in, in verse 2, he, he establishes, he is going to reign as the king. He's the king of glory. But notice what he says right after that. Listen to what he says in verse 2. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Interesting, we had just, uh, Sydney and I were speaking a moment ago, earlier before the service started, about images. And I had said, uh, it's interesting how these churches have pictures of Jesus as if we know what he looked like. And it's interesting because uh, when you look at a lot of paintings and stuff, and even in movies today, Jesus looks like a, uh, a soap opera actor. Almost like a male model. It's like, it's like, you know, when they make those movies, they'll make a, like a Jesus movie. They make one every 15, 20 years. To, to, it's a money mill. You make a lot of money doing it. So uh, they'll always get a bunch of, like, scruffy-looking actors with overgrown beards to play Peter and all the other disciples. And then they'll get this one male model, this, like, super white-skinned guy. He's got this perfectly straight hair. Oh, slightly feminized. Is that what he looks like? Probably not. In fact, the skin would have been pretty dark, being near Eastern. And then also, it says here, he had no stately form of majesty. In other words, he did not look any different than anyone else. He just looked like a normal guy. He just looked normal. That's not what his appeal was. The Son of God's appeal was on his flesh. His glory was not revealed in his own fleshly body, but what was it revealed in? Who he is. His glory. His character. And that's why it says that we should look upon him. And this is no, state, uh, no appearance that we should be attracted to him. There was no specific appearance that he had that was attractive. Verse 3. He was despised and forsaken of men. Now granted, again, 700 years. Just imagine this, brethren. 700 years. That's a long time. 700 years ago for us, that would have been uh, around 1317. 1317, that's astounding. That's a long time. A very long time. And so he says this in verse 3. Prophesying that he would be despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. In other words, people were disgusted by him. We see this in his ministry. Time and time again, what happens? He's hated. He's rejected by his own people. Especially the religious leaders. The Pharisees hated him. He called them out. But it even says they hide, they hid their face from them, from him. They even look at him. Have you ever had such a disgust 
towards someone or such an anger towards someone, you need to take a look at them. Perhaps you may have experienced that for a moment towards someone else. But that's how he was treated throughout his life. So these first three verses of chapter 53 describe and tell us a lot about who he was and what was his what was you know being around him like. He was rejected. He was lowly. We know in Matthew 11 that Jesus invites sinners. He says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's meek, he's lowly, he's humble in heart. But then we see a switch in verse 4. In fact, your Bible may have it uh, indented, or mine has it where the, the verse number is you know, bold. The letter or the number is boldened, so you can tell that it's the start of a new paragraph. So it switches here, and then he describes, really throughout the end of the chapter, the work of the suffering servant. So now he's told us a little about, about who he is, and now he's going to tell us what he did, or what he's coming to do. And it's interesting... How does Isaiah, what kind of language is he employing? Does he speak of it in a present or in a future tense? How does he speak of it? In a past tense. He uses the past tense. He speaks as if it was completed. And you know, this is amazing. This is what's so glorious about the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross is something that God had ordained for the foundation of the world to come about. That's why Isaiah prophesies like this. That's why the Bible tells us he is the lamb who was slain from the foundations of the earth. This was something God had ordained to bring about. And so what was it specifically? Well, verse 4. First word, surely. In other words, this really happened. Praise God that it did. He says, surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteem him stricken smitten of God and inflicted. In other words, he carries our sin and we consider him the one who was cursed of God. What Isaiah is saying is he takes our, our curse of sin upon himself and even though he did that, we look at him as if he was cursed, as if he was forgotten of God. Verse 5, but he was pierced through for our transgression. How precious that is to our hearts, brethren. And interesting, even this to the smallest details fulfilled, because what happens upon the cross? What happens even before he's even before he's crucified? He's whipped. We know that they use the cat nine tails as ripping the flesh off the body. He's being pierced by those, those vicious weapons of torture. And then he's nailed where? His hands and his feet pierced through for our transgressions. Even that, even that is fulfilled. It says he was crushed. Our iniquities. What is hell? What is hell? It is the wrath of God falling upon sinners. It is God crushing the ungodly. But what is the cross? God crushing his son instead. That's what the cross is. Christ satisfies the wrath of God. For us. And it says, And the chastening for our well being fell upon him. God administers forgiveness to us, brethren, because Christ drank our hell. He satisfied the wrath of God. He placated it. He appeased it. He propitiated it. He was a soothing aroma in the nostrils of the Almighty. In other words, God was pleased to slay him so that we would not be slain. That is love. That is the love of God. Listen to the last clause there in verse 5. And by his scourging we are healed. Now, a prosperity gospel preacher would come up to such a passage and say, well, look, 
Jesus' atonement on the cross buys your healing. Just claim it. Just name it. Just grab hold of it. Well, as with all things in Scripture, we consider the context. Is that what Isaiah is talking about here? Certainly not. He's not meaning physical health. But spiritual healing, forgiveness of sin, that, that is what Isaiah is talking about. Verse 6, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. God, being holy Lord of glory, has put forth his law, his commandments. He said, you shall not covet, you shall not make false gods, you shall not worship another god, but we are idol worshippers. Our hearts are idol factories. And we bow the knee to anything but God. Perverse sexual immorality, blasphemy, selfishness, pride is describe us in our lives that we live outside of Christ. And we are consigned to hell, we're consigned to that place of judgment, just awaiting, we're just sitting on death row, waiting for the, the punishment of hell, that's what all the, all the ungodly in the world, all those who are outside of Christ, what are they doing? They're just sitting on death row, they're just sitting, waiting for the final punishment, and what do we do, brethren? We cry out to them, repent and believe the gospel so that you will be saved, so you'll be saved from your sin. So we've all gone astray. We've turned our own way. And I love the next three words. But the Lord. It reminds me of Ephesians 2. When the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2, 1, and you were dead in your sin. And he goes and he describes the state of ungodly people who are not saved. In fact, I will turn there. You don't have to. But in Ephesians 2, verse 1, Paul says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Well, listen to this. Verse 4. But God the enriched mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. No mention of man, no mention of our merit or our goodness, but all God. And that is precisely what the gospel is in verse 6. We have sinned. We have gone astray. We've turned our own way. But Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to follow him. In other words, not that he became a sinner, not that he sinned, not that he broke the law, but that he was treated as a sinner. He was counted as unrighteous. He took our guilt. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. Was he not oppressed and afflicted? Absolutely. He died as an innocent man, treated as guilty. And notice, even, even this, okay, seven, keeping in our minds, 700 years, even the part of him keeping his mouth closed when he was afflicted, even that is fulfilled in Jesus' life. Because what we see in the New Testament, what happens when he's taken before the, the Sanhedrin? And the, scri and the scribes, Pharisees, ask him to make a defense for himself. What does it say he did? He did not open his mouth he did not make a defense. He did not say anything. Why? Why? To fulfill the scriptures.
so he did not open his mouth. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away again. He was not treated rightly. Instead he was treated in a wrong fashion. And as for a generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of living. Now that's very confusing. Oftentimes I'd read this when I became a new believer and I was like, what does that, that mean? He was, uh, his generation considered he was cut off out of the land of the living. In other words, they considered him, as he said earlier, they were, that he was cursed of God. He was cut off. In fact, what did they say to him on the cross? They said, if, if you and Son of God call down angels, have them get you off the cross. Paraphrasing, of course. But he knew what he had to do. He knew that he had to remain there to suffer for our sin. They thought that he was cursed of God because he was being treated in such a horrible way. But he was surely not. He became a curse for us, as Galatians 3.13 says. It says, Cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. He became a curse for us. And then he says at the end of verse 8, For the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due. In other words, the stroke of judgment, the stroke of damnation. For the transgression of my people, God says. Or, I, excuse me, I'm sorry, not God, but Isaiah, the, the people of God. Isaiah says, The transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due. In other words, is there anyone else that can die for sin and pay for it? No, because it takes God to pay for it. That is why hell is infinite. Hell is a never-ending torment. Here's why. Because God is infinite. And when you sin against an infinite God, you earn for yourself infinite punishment. You have offended an infinitely holy and pure and righteous just judge. The one who's given you so much and such grace. And yet you repudiate him in your heart. So the only way hell's punishments can be removed from us is what? How? How? How can it happen? God, Almighty God, infinite God, has to pay an infinite price. It's astounding, really, because you think about it. How can a man who is hanging upon a cross for just a few hours, 2,000 years ago... Pay for the sins of a great multitude of people that would never have to go to hell and would never suffer. It's because that man who hung upon that cross was no mere man. He was not merely a prophet. He was not merely a teacher. He was not even merely the Son of God, but He is the second person of the Blessed Trinity, eternal God, the very God of God, the Creator of all things, the great I Am, hanging on the cross. That is why the deity of Christ is absolutely non-negotiable. We will not compromise this because it is at the heart of the gospel. Verse 9. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. Even this was fulfilled. When Jesus died, who did he die in between? Two thieves. One of them was saved. We know from the record of the New Testament. So his grave is assigned with wicked men. He dies aside or in between two wicked thieves. And then it says, yet he was with a rich man in his death. Now that even is fulfilled. Who buried Jesus? Was it Peter? Was it John? Was it disciples? Was it the women? Was it even Pilate? Was it Roman soldiers? Was it the Jews? Some man burst on the scene. Joseph of Arimathea. Just out of nowhere. Comes out. We don't know much about Joseph, but we do know that Joseph of Arimathea 
was most likely wealthy. You could say rich. And here's why. The New Testament tells us he laid Jesus' body in a tomb that no other body had been laid in. It's fresh, freshly cut, freshly made. And that would have cost a pretty penny. It even cost a lot to bury people today. Back in those days, the same thing. And so Joseph of Arimathea purchases, or has perhaps inherited in his family, this tomb, who no one's ever been laid in. This virgin tomb, and he lays Jesus in there. So even, even this is fulfilled 700 years later. At the end of verse 9, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. There it is again. He's innocent. He's innocent. He didn't do anything. But listen to verse 10. Listen to the contrast. Okay, he does nothing wrong. Verse 10. But the Lord was pleased to crush him. Same thing he says in verse 5. He was crushed for our iniquities. It's the same thing here. Now, there are multiple views that have arisen within the church throughout history. Well, I'll say the visible church among Christians, quote unquote. Down through the ages, different views on the atonement of Jesus Christ. There is one view that says, well, he just died really as an example. There's one that says, well, he died to pay the ransom to Satan so we could be bought from Satan and we could be in the family of God. Such views are unbiblical. They have no ground in Scripture. He didn't die as an example merely. He didn't die to pay Satan to buy us. Satan's in God's hand. God is sovereign over Satan. He is bound. He is bound. So who did Jesus die for then? It really wasn't to be an example to us necessarily for, at the front. There's many reasons, I mean, in terms of, okay, yeah, Christ was an example that we were to continue faithful to God, etc., etc. But what was the, what's the heart? What's the big reason why he does this? He died for God. He died to God. He died to satisfy God. To please God. That is why he died. The Lord is pleased to crush him. Put him to grief. In fact, that this whole chapter, if I could choose my favorite verse, favorite line, or two lines, it would be verse 10. Because this is our salvation. As I said earlier, hell is God releasing his wrath and his judgment on sinners. But the cross is God unleashing it on his son so he could show grace and forgiveness and salvation to us, my dear brethren. And so he says if he would render himself as a guilt offering, he died for guilt. He will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Notice what he says. He says, if he does these things, if he dies, I'm going to give him things. I'm going to give him offspring. I'm going to prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Who are his offspring? He's talking about actual children? No, spiritual. We are the spiritual offspring of the Son. He will prolong his days. Jesus will reign on his throne forever. All these things are fulfilled. He, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He delights in God. He's seated at the right hand of the Father right now. All this points to Christ's fulfillment. Verse 11. As a result of the anguish of his soul. Brethren, my dear brethren. Many people will say... It must have been horrible for Jesus to have been nailed to that cross, to have been beat, to have been spat upon and humiliated. Absolutely. And I never want to take away from his physical suffering. But let me draw your attention to something. What does verse 11 say? That God is satisfied by. Is it the anguish of his hands? Is it the anguish of his feet? Is it the anguish of his back or his body? Is it the anguish of anything physical? No, the text simply reads, the anguish of his soul. See, something was happening at the cross 
which the visible eye cannot see, which the disciples could not see, which the Roman soldiers could not see, which the women could not see watching from a distance, and that was this. The Father turns away and forsakes His Son. The Father crushes His Son in His undying love for His people. Such love is shown in this that the members of the Trinity would work in a unit to accomplish salvation. God saw the suffering of his soul and he was satisfied. What did Jesus cry out on the cross? Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was satisfied by that. Verse 11, by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. This is the result, brethren. God justifies us. He declares us righteous. He looks upon us as having lived Jesus' life, as having been forgiven of our sins, as having been perfectly righteous. He will justify the many as He bears our iniquities. He bore our sin. Think about your sin. Let it break you. But let the cross of Jesus Christ bring such joy to your heart this day. And not only that he died, but rose. He's alive. He rose on the third day. We do not meet on Friday or Wednesday or whatever day Jesus died upon. We meet on the Lord's Day, on Sunday, because he rose on this day. He rose victorious. He defeated the grave. In verse 12, listen to the promise that God gives to his son. See, as I spoke on, on Wednesday night, Salvation is a covenant between the Father and the Son, the eternal covenant of redemption. God elects His people to salvation in eternity past, and the Son, in agreement to that, comes and fulfills that covenant. He keeps it. And so God then rewards him, and that's why in verse 12 He says, Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great. In other words, I'm going to give him a reward. He will divide the booty with the strong. He will be, he will be the King of glory because He poured out Himself to death. Are you struggling with assurance? Are you struggling with the assurance of your salvation? Look to Christ, brethren. Shall any drop of the Savior's blood be in vain? Shall his death be in vain? Shall his satisfaction of God's wrath against your sin be in vain? May it never be. No. He's satisfied. It's gone. There's only grace for us in Christ. It says, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. He was counted among those who hated God. Yet he himself bore the sin of many. He bore our sin, the sins of his bride, the church. And he interceded for the transgressors. We need an intercessor before God. What, is the, what does Rome tell us? What does the Roman Catholic Church tell us? Well, you, there's, you can have many kinds. You the Pope, is, you can have one. You can pray to Mary, any other saints. You know, the Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He is our intercessor. And He will intercede for us. Think about that right now, brethren. Just let your mind meditate upon that, that Jesus right now is in heaven, is seated on, the, on his throne, at the right hand of the Father's throne, and he's interceding for you. Satan comes and makes accusation, as the Bible says, one after another against us, and someone takes up our case. Who is it? Christ. But notice, unlike in the court of law on earth, what does the defendant often do, or the, the attorney, do, attorney do for the defendant? They'll talk about how good they are, their accomplishments, this and that. You know what Christ does? He doesn't argue for us. He argues his own righteousness, his own performance, his own death, his own resurrection. He argues what he's done, 
And every single time, justice is brought about. Because Christ pays for our sin, He satisfies the wrath of God, and God administers eternal redemption for us and forgives us. He has and forevermore will forgive us. This is the work of the suffering servant. This is what Christ has done. And notice, again, 700 years before Jesus came, and not only that, but He speaks as if it's already happened. That's because this lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. This eternal covenant of redemption was made in eternity past. And Christ has fulfilled it. Hallelujah to the God of salvation. The God of grace and of glory. Brethren, let's look to Jesus today. <clears throat> Whatever's going on in your life, whatever you're struggling with, Perhaps it is assurance of salvation. Perhaps it is something totally different. Perhaps a trial. Financial strengths. An issue with a family member. Whatever it may be. Look to Him. Look to Christ. Or on the days when you feel great about yourself and everything's going good. Look to Christ. Look to Christ. When everything is going bad, look to Christ. He is our joy. He is our God, our exceeding joy, as Psalm 43, 4 says. And so we find our joy in Him. And if you've never truly looked to Christ, turn the eye of faith to Him today. If you're outside of Him, come and drink freely of the waters. If you're outside of Christ, I invite you to come. As Isaiah 55, 1 says, Ho! Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Without, come buy wine and milk. Without money, without cost. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread and your wages for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander to the peoples. Verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may, he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. And he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. That is the offer of the gospel, and it is extended to everyone. It is extended to all. Come, that you may have life. He who thirsts, come. Come to the water. Drink. Verse 17 of Revelation 22, at the end, of the, at the conclusion of all Scripture, is an evangelistic call. Verse 17, the Spirit of the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. Come and live. So in conclusion, we've seen that even though God is holy and He has said not to sin against Him, not to blaspheme Him, and we've done those things, we've sinned, surely we have, we've gone astray, as the text says, and we deserve hell, Christ comes in and fulfills the law, satisfies the wrath of God against us. That is the love of God that is manifested towards sinners, and He rose on the, on the third day and is seated in heaven now and one must simply repent and believe the gospel and they will be saved from their sin. They will be forgiven and wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. You will if you come. And brethren, we have been saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are in Him. God sees us as righteous in Him. Our gracious Lord. Our compassionate Savior. The one to whom all Scripture testifies. The one of whom all Scriptures testify. The one of whom Isaiah 53 testifies. The suffering servant. And ultimately, who gets the glory for it? Who gets the reward? He does. The lamb is worthy. 
The Lamb is worthy. He was slain to receive glory, to receive honor and exaltation, to be worshipped, to be adored. For He has suffered so much. Suffered so much to buy our salvation. In Revelation 7, verse 10, the great multitude of those who will stand in God's presence in glory one day say, verse 10, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. May to this suffering servant be glory forever. Let's pray. Father, what more can I say other than thank you? As even one of the most simple Bible verses John 3, 16 says that you sent your son because you so loved the world. You did this because you have a particular eternal saving love for your church. We thank you, Father. We thank you. We worship you. We glorify you as the God of glory, the just holy one. Hallelujah to the Lord of hosts. Blessed be the Lord, the Lord of hosts, from everlasting to everlasting. And we love you, Lord God, in reciprocation for the love with which you have loved us. And we all say this and we all pray this and enter in your presence only through the precious blood of the Lamb only through Christ. We would not dare try any other way, whether it be ourselves or some other teacher or false preacher. It's in Christ alone. Our hope is found. In Christ alone, so that He gets glory alone. Amen.